Carving up Africa. Australia was far away, but the mysterious jungles and plains of Africa seemed just as distant. As far as Great Britain, Germany, France, and the other countries of Europe were concerned, Africa was a wild, mysterious, distant land. After David Livingston, other explorers had followed his tracks. They had traveled down the Nile River to its source, and sailed across the wide Congo into Africa's unknown center. They found hundreds of miles of wealth, elephants with ivory tusks, ground filled with gold and silver to be mined, limestone waiting to be quarried, rubber plants, wide fields, perfect for cotton, coffee, and tea. No European had ever laid claim to this land, so as far as the explorers were concerned, no one owned it. France, Germany, and Great Britain, not to mention Spain, Portugal, and Russia, all built more and more trading posts around the coasts of Africa. By the end of the 1870s, there were plenty of European traders and missionaries in Africa, but most of the African continent itself was still under the control of African chiefs and kings. Then, two countries began to push for more. Leopold, the king of Belgium, seized the most land. Even before he inherited the throne of Belgium, Prince Leopold wanted his tiny country to grow larger by claiming colonies all around the world. Five years before becoming king, he told his people, I believe that the moment has come for us to extend our territories. I think that we must lose no time under penalty of seeing the few remaining good positions seized upon by more enterprising nations than our own. And just one year later, he told his countrymen, Imitate your neighbors. Extend beyond the sea whenever an opportunity is offered. You will there find precious outlets for your products, food for your commerce, and a still better position in the great European family. When Prince Leopold became King Leopold II, he tried to convince the Belgian Parliament to claim the center of Africa, the Congo Basin, for its own. Parliament refused. So Leopold announced that he was going to found a new charity, the International African Association, which would bring modern science and trade into Africa. He hired Henry Stanley, the explorer who had gone into Africa and looked for Livingston, to help him map out trade routes into the Congo. Henry Stanley mapped out a route a thousand miles long. Leopold II built trading posts and little medical offices all along this route in the name of the International African Association. And then he announced that all unclaimed land along the route was actually his own private personal colony in Africa. The German states were not far behind. In 1880, only nine years after the German states had reluctantly agreed to recognize Wilhelm as the German emperor, the Second Reich was claiming lands in both the east and the west of Africa for Germany. The other countries of Europe didn't intend to be left behind, while Belgium and Germany took the riches of Africa for their own. Portugal claimed the southeastern African coast. The French took control of lands in the west, southwest, and north, and also convinced chiefs in the upper Congo to sign treaties of peace in exchange for bolts of cloth and barrels of alcohol. Italy signed a treaty of alliance with Ethiopia in the northeast of Africa, and Great Britain claimed pieces of the southeastern coast, the southern tip of Africa, and a few scattered kingdoms along Africa's western coast. All of these countries wanted still more. The years after 1880 became known as the Scramble, because so many countries were elbowing each other to gain control of African land. Every country in Europe believed that whatever country held the most foreign territory could claim to be the greatest. In 1884, Germany invited the rest of Europe to a conference in the German city of Berlin. At this Berlin conference, representatives from a dozen different countries decided that it would be best for everyone if France, Germany, Portugal, Italy, and all the other countries of Europe didn't fight over Africa. After all, Wars were expensive. 
it would be simpler to just agree on some way to divide the land fairly. After all, there was a lot of Africa to go around. So at the Berlin Conference, the countries of Europe agreed that if any country built trading posts and missionary stations in any area of Africa, that country had occupied the area and could claim it. No other country would try to claim or attack that territory. Everyone signed the agreement and went home, pleased with their civilized and peaceful solution. But this very civilized and peaceful solution ignored the African tribes who had lived in these occupied countries for thousands of years. Most Europeans thought that the Africans who lived in the plains and jungles of their continent weren't fully human, certainly not smart enough to control their own land. For Europeans, Africans were like children who had to be watched over, guided, and controlled. Although the Berlin Conference was supposed to prevent war, it actually caused a hundred years of unhappiness and unrest in Africa. When a European country occupied part of Africa, it drew lines around its new colony and gave it a name, like British Somalia or Rhodesia. But long before Europeans started drawing lines around colonies, African tribes had been making alliances and fighting wars with each other. When European countries started laying out new borders for new countries, they often drew lines that divided friendly tribes from each other and locked hostile tribes together inside the same country borders. By 1900, every mile of Africa, except for Ethiopia on the eastern coast and the little country of Liberia on the western coast, had been claimed by a European country. The enormous continent of Africa had been divided. Germany, Italy, Britain, Portugal, Spain, and France had taken every square inch. An African-American writer named W.E.B. Du Bois was in his teens when the Berlin Conference ended. He watched the changes that Europeans brought to Africa as they built trading posts and missionary stations and took Africa for their own. As a grown man, he wrote, the invading investors who wanted cheap labor at the gold mines, the diamond mines, the copper and tin mines, the oil forests and cocoa fields, followed the missionaries. The authority of the family was broken up. The authority and tradition of the clan disappeared. The power of the chief was transmuted into the rule of the white district commissioner. By the end of the 19th century, the degradation of Africa was as complete as organized human means could make it.